In this video, we will go from the RM system in bacterial immunity to molecular biology, where we will compare different types of restriction enzymes, their function, nomenclature, and also categorize the enzymes from a practical standpoint, the types of cuts they make, and how restriction enzymes can sometimes display relaxed specificity. Our journey begins with the discovery of molecular immunity in bacteria. The so-called restriction modification system allows the bacteria to monitor any incoming DNA, and the monitoring and identification usually leads to the destruction of the foreign DNA. Bacteria don't usually get the same type of cough or a flu like we do, but viruses love humans and bacteria equally. There is a certain class of virus called bacteriophages, which infect bacteria by injecting its DNA into the bacteria. To evade this infection, bacteria have evolved a special system that detects and destroys this foreign DNA upon recognition. Imagine this is a viral DNA which is injected and it contains a short four bases, GATC, in its DNA. Once this viral DNA is inside the bacteria, certain bacterial enzymes will find this GATC sequence and cut around the GATC. As a result, the viral DNA is chopped into smaller pieces and the bacteria does not get infected. The enzymes in question are called restriction enzymes. They recognize specific DNA sequences, and in our example it was GATC, but it could be any other sequence. And after recognition, they will cut the DNA. This also means that the restriction enzyme is a class of endonucleases. Now we can start peeling a few more layers and understand how this immunity actually works, because I haven't explained about the modification part of this immunity. Imagine that this happy bacteria is attacked by a bacteriophage. By the logic of immunity, we expect on this first encounter, the bacteria will destroy the virus DNA. And for the sake of discussion, let's say that this is a lambda bacteriophage. And the E. coli is a special strain called C. These are just names, so don't overthink them for now. Now, this infection can be enlarged such that there are millions of such infections happening. In some rare cases, it is possible that the viral DNA is able to survive the bacterial immune system, and the infection results in virus particles that mature from E. coli C infection. Again, this is a rare event, so very few of these viruses are produced. Since this virus was made inside E. coli C, we will call this virus particle Lambda C. You can take this Lambda C phage and reinfect the E. coli C. Or you can infect a new type of E. coli strain called K. The Lambda C will inject its DNA into both of these bacteria. However, this time around, the E. coli C is unable to destroy Lambda C DNA. This is interesting. As a result, you get a lot of virus particles from this infection. This is not a rare event. The Lambda C infected E. coli C, and obviously the progenies are also now named Lambda C. But something different happens when this Lambda C infects bacteria K. It turns out K bacteria is immune to Lambda C, and it can easily destroy its DNA. Another way to say this is that Lambda C is restricted in E. coli K. But if you do this infection in very, very large amounts, there's a chance that very small amount of virus is made in E. coli K. But this rare population, which started as Lambda C, will now be called Lambda K. In case you haven't noticed, the name change of the virus depends on the host in which it was made. So somehow the Lambda C is modified in E. coli K. And this event is rare. Now we're starting to enter the restriction and modification system that I promised we will explore. You can repeat the experiment again by using Lambda K as the starting virus and infect both C and K bacteria. You can pause the video and try to predict what the outcome would be. What are the names of the viruses produced in both these infections and whether they are produced in small or large amounts? The bacteria K will be unable to protect itself from the Lambda K and this infection will lead to large amounts of Lambda K virus particles. In contrast, only rare virus particles are produced when bacteria C is infected with Lambda K. So by definition, Lambda K is restricted in E. coli C.
And likewise, lambda k is also then modified in E. coli C. So through this process of restriction and modification, the rare virus is lambda C. You can continue the cycle of infection and you will keep observing the same restriction and modification pattern. We talked about this chopping of DNA, but how can you modify lambda phage into different forms and make the restriction somehow depend on the host? We know restriction enzymes recognize sequences and cut them, but what about modification? Let's dive deeper into the working of restriction and modification system. And for the sake of understanding, let's assume two specific sets of sequences, GATC and GGTCC. Also assume that E. coli C carries a modification on A, wherever GATC appears. So all the adenines are modified only when the A is in the GATC. And there is an enzyme that does this specific modification at GATC by specifically recognizing GATC. Similarly, there is a restriction enzyme that finds GATC, importantly the non-modified GATC, and cuts it. So the genome of E. coli C has this structure, with adenines modified if the A is in GATC. I will make this clear once more, because this is really important. The enzyme that recognizes GATC will only cut GATC if the GATC is non-modified. And as we noted, the bacterial genome in E. coli C has modified GATC. And with that reasoning, the bacterial restriction enzyme cannot cut its own DNA. So when a lambda phage infects the E. coli C, the viral DNA will be chopped up at the GATC because the GATCs are not modified. E. coli C does not care about GGTCC. But let's turn our attention to E. coli K. Given these two sets of sequences, the E. coli K carries a modification on the cytosine of GGTCC. Same logic here, that there is an enzyme that recognizes this specific set of sequences, and there is a restriction enzyme that recognizes GGTCC and cuts it only when the GGTCC is non-modified. So E. coli K, instead of GATC, cares only about GGTCC. One detail I haven't clarified, the modification enzyme is usually adding a methyl group to the specific base. And later in this video and in the upcoming videos, it'll become clear that methylation is the primary, if not the only modification. The point being that because of this methyl group at the specific sequence, the restriction enzyme cannot bind it or cut it because of this bulky modification. This, however, is not a universal truth. But for the sake of this discussion, these are the rules. Now we can revisit our schematic of this viral infection and you will see how all of this begins to make sense. Assume that the incoming lambda phage has a DNA which somewhere contains GATC and GGTCC. Once it passes the E. coli C to make lambda C, the DNA is modified by the modifying enzymes of C. bacteria. So the genome of lambda C has modified GATC. The modification is at GATC because we are following the rules that we laid out before. Now, if lambda C reinfects E. coli C, the C bacteria cannot recognize lambda DNA as foreign, and therefore it escapes restriction enzyme cutting. By the rules we established, remember the restriction enzyme can only cut non-modified DNA. In lambda C, the GATC is modified. The other case is more interesting, because when lambda C infects E. coli K, the K-strain bacteria only cares about the status of GGTCC. So lambda C gets restricted in E. coli K because GGTCC is not modified. Again, by the same rules, the restriction enzyme cuts non-modified sites, so it is restricted. But a small amount that does escape the cutting is modified. Therefore, the resulting lambda K genome has a modification of GGTCC. The A in GATC is missing the modification because the enzyme that modifies only modifies GGTCC. It does not care about GATC. The original modification is lost when the DNA is replicated. So we have converted lambda C to lambda K. When lambda K reinfects E. coli K, now it will detect this modification 
and because of the modification, the restriction enzymes will not be able to cut the DNA. But when lambda K infects E. coli C, well, E. coli C does not care about GGTCC. It only looks for GATC. If it is missing the modification on GATC, like we saw in the beginning, lambda K will be restricted in E. coli C. But those DNA molecules that do survive will be converted into lambda C modification pattern. This lambda C pattern is the same that we started in the first place. Hopefully now you understand the interplay of changing modification status and its correlation with immunity which depends on the restriction modification system of the host. I have simplified the system to these sequences, but in principle you can have more than one restriction modification system per bacteria. Alright, now let's give formal definition to a couple of terms. The restriction enzymes or restriction endonucleases, and you have many abbreviations for them, are enzymes that cleave DNA at or near a specific recognition site. There are three key things to note. Usually, restriction enzymes are denoted by a prefix R, at least technically. We will circle back to this later. The modification enzymes are methylases or methyltransferases. These are enzymes that modify DNA at or near a specific recognition site, and they usually have a prefix M. Restriction system is meant as an attack system. The modification system, by and large, is meant as a protect system. But there are cases where it is also used to attack, so protection is not a universal feature. There are at least four major types of restriction enzymes. The first type is absolutely useless. This is primarily because you have a single enzyme that carries out both the R and M function. The type 2 system has further subcategories, like 2P and 2S, and this will be the primary focus of this series. Almost all molecular cloning relies on the 2P system. The 2S has specific use cases. They're a bit more complex. The good thing is that type 2 systems have two separate R and M enzymes. Type 3 enzymes are again useless because both functions are built into one single enzyme. Type 4 have separate R and M enzymes, but they are useless because they have quite weak recognition. Now, here's a question for you. Why is it that being a single enzyme with both R and M function makes the enzyme useless in molecular biology? Let me know your answer down in the comments. Okay, sometimes you may see a type 5 system, which includes Cas9 from CRISPR-Cas9 in the type of restriction system. Cautionary note that Cas9 is not an RM system, so whoever calls Cas9 type 5 is in my opinion wrong. Side note, the type 2 system has many other subcategories as well. You don't need to know them, but at least you should know that they exist. Also, just so that this is super clear, the separate enzymes really means that there are two separate reading frames for both R and M enzymes. Generally, all restriction enzymes need magnesium as cofactor, and the methylases need edomet as the methyl donor. Let's focus on these two important categories and understand them in a bit more detail. When you say type 2 enzymes, we default to the 2P category. So you never actually call them 2P, it is simply type 2. But for the sake of clarity, I think it is good to know. Anyways, the P stands for palindromic specificity, the S in 2S stands for shifted cleavage, and in a moment you will understand why they're named like that. Again, type 2 enzymes are like the 90% of all used restriction enzymes. Structurally, the R and M enzymes are separate. The R is a dimeric enzyme, the M is the monomeric part. In the case of 2S, these enzymes are monomeric. The recognition sequence for the 2P enzyme is always palindromic, whereas the 2S sequence is not palindromic, so it has asymmetry. 2P enzymes cleave within their recognition site, whereas 2S enzymes cleave outside of the recognition. The outside is typically on the 3' end of the recognition site, and that is the shifted cleavage. Now hopefully you can tell where the names of the categories come from. Let's go deeper and understand these systems by an example. Take this sequence of DNA. Notice that it reads GAATTC in both directions. 
This is what we call a palindromic DNA sequence. And this palindrome can have any DNA base around the sequence. This palindromic sequence in this specific direction is a recognition sequence for restriction enzyme, which will cut each of the DNA strands at the recognition site denoted by the arrow. The enzyme recognizing GAATTC and cutting it is called ECOR1. For now, ignore the name of the enzyme and only notice that the enzyme is recognizing and cutting at the recognition sequence. The points at which the cut is made is specific to the enzyme and you don't have to memorize this. However, given this information about the cut location, you should know how the DNA would look after it has been cut. The left side of the cut DNA would look like this, where this G is that G and this A is that A. Likewise, you can write the other half of the DNA and you can roughly outline the position at which the cut was made. To put this point across once more, the recognition was a palindromic sequence and the cut was made within the recognition sequence. Now take the example of this DNA sequence, which as you can tell is not a palindrome it does not read the same in both directions. And let's imagine there are some DNA sequences around this site, which can be anything. This DNA sequence is recognized by a specific enzyme, which makes a cut quite far away from the recognition site at position 9 and 13. Recall, we did say that type 2S enzymes have a tendency to cut at 3' prime ends outside of the recognition site. And that is the shifted cleavage. You don't have to remember where and how it cuts, but given this information, you have to be able to write how the DNA would look once you have made the cut. So the left side will end up looking like this. Oh, I hope you caught this mistake before I did. So the top strand will have ends after the GGATG, and you will have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 ends here. And the cut extends to the N13 on the bottom strand. So you will have four extra ends on the bottom strand. Instead of this representation, you can also say that it is N13. Similarly, you can write the other side as well, which will have likewise four ends on the top strand, which can be shortened to N4. Here is an important distinction to keep in mind. The original site in this case is intact, whereas in the case of 2P enzymes, the site is split into two parts. The example of the 2P system was ECOR1 enzyme. The enzyme which recognizes and cleaves with GGATG is called FOC1. Now here's some exercises for you to test your understanding. Here's an enzyme called HIN3 which recognizes AAGCTT and it cuts like this. Can you write how the DNA would look for HIN3 after it cuts the recognition site? If you can do it for HIN3, Try also doing it for NOT1. If you can do HIN3 and NOT1, then try it on BSA1, which is a type 2S enzyme. So can you write the resulting DNA fragment like we did for FOC1? Alright, a few things before we move on. The ECOR1 recognizes 6 nucleotides, and for that reason it is a 6 base cutter. FOC1 is a 5 base cutter, BSA1 is a 6, HIN3 is a 6, and NOT1, if you count, is an 8 base cutter. Likewise, there are enzymes that recognizes 4 base cutter, and that's as low as you can go. On the upper end, there are very few enzymes that are 8 plus base cutters. Even 8 base pair cutters are pretty rare, because the longer the sequence, the probability you find this exact sequence becomes quite low. We will touch on these rare and common cutting enzymes in a later video. One side note, FOC1 typically cuts and results in N9 and N13, but there are cases when it will cut and give you N8, N12, or N10, N12 pattern as well. This relates to reaction conditions, and I will circle back to this apparent misbehavior of the enzyme towards the end of the video. Let's talk about the naming of these enzymes, because it seems like there is a consistent, yet a very weird way of writing them. Let's take the example of ECOR1. The E comes from Esteria, the genus of the bacteria in which it was discovered. The co is from coli, the species of the bacteria in that genus in which it was identified. The R represents the strain of the bacteria. Sometimes strains are missing. BSA1, for instance, is missing the strain 
The strain is also always not capitalized. In HIN3, the D is a strain, but it is not capitalized. Strains can be named whatever. For instance, RY13 is named after the person RN Yoshimori who identified the strain. The number is the Roman numeral at the end, which is associated with the sequence or order in which the enzyme was discovered in the EcoR strain. For instance, there is HIND1, 2, and 3. The number tells you that HIND1 was the first identified enzyme in the HIND sequence of enzymes. To make the picture complete, let's bring the restriction enzyme and pair it with the modification enzyme, as we started out discussing in the beginning. The example of EcoR1, strictly speaking, has a restriction version called R-EcoR1, which cuts non-modified restriction site GAATTC. In the bacteria, in a natural state, there is a modifying version of EcoR1, which also recognizes the same GAATTC, but instead performs the methylation on the internal adenine. If you recall the discussion we had, the EcoR1 will be unable to cut the GAATTC because the bulky methyl group blocks the active site of the enzyme. And these two enzymes are separate enzymes made by two separate reading frames. All this information can be used to represent the enzymes and their function in a special style of writing. For instance, EcoR1 cuts GAATTC at a certain site and modifies a certain adenine. You can write the shorthand version of this cut by using a forward slash. Since it is palindrome, it doesn't matter. And the methylation nucleotide is represented by this asterisk. Likewise, HIN3 can be represented like this too. So asterisk at the modified base and slashes at the cut site. You don't have to memorize sequences or remember which base is modified. All that information is one Google search away from you. But when you see this representation, you should be able to understand what that pattern means and how it translates into a double-stranded DNA. Now that you understand how enzymes work, there is a functional categorization of restriction enzymes, and it is quite useful for practical reasons. The first bucket is a class called isoschizomers. These are a set of restriction enzymes that recognize the same DNA sequences and cut the DNA at the same points. Take this palindromic sequence which is cut near GG, and here is the outcome of this cut. This exact sequence and this exact style of cut is made by these three different restriction enzymes. So we can call these three restriction enzymes isoschizomers. There's a slight nuance. In an isoschizomer set, there's always an enzyme which was identified first. The OG, the elder one. We call this OG enzyme a prototype. So sometimes you will see old papers saying that SPF1 and XAA5 are isoschizomers for SDA1. Okay, second set of bucket is neoschizomers. These are a set of restriction enzymes that recognize the same DNA sequence, but they cleave it at different points. Take this palindromic DNA, for instance. It is recognized by both SMA1 and XMA1. SMA1 cuts it in the middle, and the result looks like this, whereas XMA cuts it on the sides, and the result look very different from the SMA1 cut. So, same sequence, but cleaved differently. And the language is that these two are neoschizomers of each other. The third bucket is isocodomer. To understand isocodomer, we have to understand the nature and types of cleaved ends. In this neoschizomer example, we notice that you have two types of cuts. One where there is no overhang. The other with a single stranded DNA overhang. The straight cut is a blunt or flush cut. So the ends are blunt or flush, even though there are no real ends to speak of. In contrast, the overhanging ends are called sticky or cohesive ends. The sticky or cohesiveness comes from the fact that the ends from the same cut are compatible and stick with each other. If you have played the game of Tetris, this is pretty much that. The length of the overhang depends on the enzyme. It can be four bases, three bases, shorter or longer depending on the enzyme. So isocodomers are a set of restriction enzymes that recognize and thereby cleave different DNA sequence, but the resulting sticky end is the same.
Take BCL1, for example, which cuts TGA, TCA, and gives you a sticky end that looks like this. Compare this with BAMH1, which cuts GGA, TCC. A slightly different sequence, but if you compare the sticky ends, they're the same as BCL1. This means that the DNA ends produced from these two enzymes can stick to each other. So we say that BAMH1 and BCL1 are isocodomers. Great, now we're at the last little section of this video. It is about enzymes misbehaving, commonly known as star activity of an enzyme. By definition, it means that an enzyme is capable of cleaving a DNA sequence that is similar to its target sequence. Our friend EcoR1 cleaves GAA, TTC. If EcoR1 exhibits star activity, it will start to degrade a sequence that looks the same on the inside, but the outside can have any base. Remember the folk one, which can have a weird pattern of cutting as well? All this misbehavior or star activity depends when the reaction conditions are not optimal. Maybe the enzyme is too high in concentration. Maybe the substrate is too low, which means relatively high enzyme concentration. Maybe there is an ion imbalance, changes in pH, glycerol concentration, time of reaction. All these things can have an alteration in the specificity of the enzyme. More often than not, star activity begins when all the target sequences are used up by the enzyme, so there is nothing available to cut if nothing is available. Well, anything that looks like target then will become the target. The FOC1 case is a subtle variation on the star activity, because 2S enzymes don't cut their recognition sites, so the star activity may manifest in a slightly different way. Alright, there were a lot of basic things covered in this video. This is all to build a foundation for some slightly complex things that will come later. I hope it was useful and I will see you in the next video.